All right. Good morning. I'm Matthew Continetti, Director of Domestic Policy here at the American Enterprise Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event. 30 years of environmental progress. Is it time at last to be optimistic? In 1968, Paul and Ann Ehrlich published The Population Bomb. The book repurposed the ideas of 18th century economist Thomas Malthus to argue that population growth would soon outpace agricultural growth, leading to widespread famine and other social and ecological crises. These ideas took hold of the American environmental movement, which adopted a broadly pessimistic view of our planet's future. The Ehrlich's predictions did not come to pass, but alarmism over the effect of population growth on the environment, as well as resource scarcity, endures among many on the left. In recent years, the notion that Americans should stop having children to protect the environment has been promoted widely by academics, journalists, and other public figures. According to analysts at Morgan Stanley, the movement to not have children owing to fears over climate change is growing and impacting fertility rates quicker than any preceding trend in the field of fertility decline. Despite these anxieties, the available data on environmental trends makes it clear that we've made enormous progress in environmental issues over the last 30 years, both within the United States and around the world. We are here this Earth Day, then, to explore what that progress has looked like, how environmental data should shape future public policy decisions, and why we sh and ask and answer why we should be optimistic about America's environmental future. Our speakers this morning are Stephen F. Hayward and Roger Pilkey, Jr., from 2002 to 20, 2012, Stephen was a fellow here at AEI, where he authored an annual report on environmental trends and controversies titled The Index of Leading Environmental Indicators. The index analyzed and summarized overlooked government data on the environment, most of which demonstrated substantial environmental progress over the last generation. In 2010, Stephen published Mere Environmentalism, a biblical perspective on humans and the natural world which explored the philosophical presuppositions of the modern environmentalist movement. And this morning's discussion will expand on many of Stephen's themes and evidence uh, contained in that work. Today, Stephen Hayward is a resident scholar at the University of California, Berkeley's Institute of Government Studies, and a fellow of the Law and Public Policy Program at Berkeley Law. He's also a professor at Pepperdine University a popular blogger at powerlineblog.com. He's written a number of books on the history of the American conservative movement of particular interest to me, including the two-volume Age of Reagan, excellent book, and another excellent book, Patriotism is Not Enough, Harry Jaffa, Walter Burns, and the Arguments that Reshaped American Conservatism. Roger Pilkey Jr., meanwhile, is a non-resident senior fellow here at AAI and a professor in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. His work explores science and technology policy with a particular focus on energy and climate and the politicization of science. He writes the popular substack, The Honest Broker, which we are happy to host on the AEI homepage these days, in addition to the substack platform, and is the author of several books, including The Rightful Place of Science, Disasters and Climate Change, and The Climate Fix, What Scientists and Politicians Won't Tell You About Global Warming. Stephen Hayward will begin this morning with a presentation on leading environmental indicators. Roger will then offer some remarks on climate change in particular, which tends to overshadow other environmental issues in public discourse. And afterwards, Stephen and Roger will discuss what we have learned about the environment in recent years and how the environmental movement should proceed. We'll then open the floor to audience Q&A. If you're watching online, and I know many of you are, please submit any questions you may have to guydenton at aei.org, that is guy, G-U-I dot Denton, D-E-N-T-O-N, at A-E-I dot org, or send a question via X slash Twitter using hashtag environmental progress. And with that, please join me in welcoming Stephen F. Hayward back to A-E-I. Get the first one going there. Oh, oh, green button. There it is, green button. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Uh, it, uh, it used to be a big deal. You know, there often was a lot of media coverage for it, and a lot of times uh, significant public events, a big rally out here on the mall, or festivals in American cities and on college campuses. And now it passes kind of quietly, and therein, I think, lies a tale, although it's a tale with a very large asterisk. 
which I'll come to at the very end. Uh, and you may be able to guess about it, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, if you, and my point is, is that uh, we now have arrived at a moment for environmental optimism, broadly speaking, not just in the United States and wealthy industrial countries, but increasingly around the world, I think. Uh, if you cast your mind back to you know, 35, 40 years ago, uh, you may remember every January, the World Watch Institute would put out their State of the World report. Uh, and it always got a lot of press. Uh, and of course, it was all, you know, Lester Brown was the chief instigator of this, and he was one of the prominent figures of environmentalism in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. And this is just one report of many you could point to, but it got a lot of press, and it was always, everything's terrible. Uh, the world is doomed, it's very Malthusian uh, in its outlook. Uh, and this was reflected in public opinion. Uh, back in those days, uh, the Worthland Group, uh, Dick Worthland was Ronald Reagan's pollster, used to do an annual poll every other year on the environment, and found that uh, you know, large majorities of Americans thought environmental quality in America was getting worse. Uh, the Roper people, which also the, the Roper poll doesn't exist anymore, there it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had the question, the next 10 years will be the last decade. What this, you know, when we only have 10 years left to do something has been a trope of environmental discourse since the first Earth Day in 1970, 54 years ago, and we're still here with 10-year countdowns. Uh, so it, it clearly uh, was reflected uh, in uh, public consciousness. And of course, everyone knows the headlines. I mean, these are some old ones, but everyone remembers all the headlines about everything's terrible and we're all gonna, uh, we're all gonna die. One of the first markers, I think, of the beginning of a slow change can be traced back to, or, or I, I like to start with this. This is an ad from the New York Times from David Brower, also one of the great figures of environmentalism in the sixth, from the 50s, really, to the 90s. He was the longtime head of the Sierra Club when it changed from being a hiking and conservation organization to a politically active organization. And this was a full-page ad in the New York Times, and you can see the headline, Economics as a Form of Brain Damage. This is only half the ad, by the way. It was a full page, which I think even then cost $50,000 to place. And what it said was, it was a letter to the Clinton administration. Please, please don't use this cost-benefit analysis that the Reagan administration and the Bush administration have used for all these years to stop sensible environmental regulation. And not only did the Clinton administration not take that advice and kept using the cost-benefit formulas that had developed during the Reagan years, but when Barack Obama came into office in 2009. Uh, he installed as head of the of regulatory analysis at the OMB, uh, at a unit that actually had been started by AEI's previous president, Chris DeMuth, uh, way back in the Reagan years. He appointed Cass Sunstein to run that operation. And, and Cass Sunstein is you know, a really smart center-left thinker, but devoted to the idea that cost-benefit analysis makes good sense. There was some grumbling from environmental groups about that appointment, but uh, it got nowhere. And then the idea of cost-benefit analysis went mainstream. Uh, in particular, 2009, uh, it had Richard Rivez uh, and his co-author, uh, William Livermore, and then there's sort of you know, center-left or conventional environmental thinkers, I think. They published a very serious book saying, I'll paraphrase it this way, let's not leave cost-benefit analysis to those libertarian right-wing fanatics. We ought to embrace it, too, because it makes good sense. And so the point is, is, I don't think very many environmentalists today would use that slogan, environmentalism is a form of brain damage. Um, environmental economics is now pretty mainstream, even if often poorly done. I'm tempted to just use that old Dr. Johnson line that uh, it's not that it's done well, like uh, you know, uh, women preaching or dogs standing on their hind legs, if you know that famous old quote uh, from Samuel Johnson. Um, now, it was around that time in the early 90s but I woke up one day and saw that William Bennett had made this great public sensation with his index of leading cultural indicators. It was about 35 pages long, uh, simple charts and graphs of time series about all kinds of bad stuff happening. It was teenage pregnancy and crime rates and test scores and drug dependency and welfare dependency. And Rush Limbaugh picked up on it and eventually became a book, but it was this huge sensation. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head, knowing a bit about air quality statistics in California, where I grew up with really bad smog in LA, um, I got to thinking, you know, the same kind of treatment in the US would show mostly improvement. Not on everything, but on a lot of big things. Uh, and so I thought, I'm just gonna copy that format. Um, 
And then for several years, as Matt mentioned, I put out an annual report. It varied between 50 and 70 pages. You wanted to keep it short enough that someone could actually get through it, but have enough substance to it to actually say something. Uh, and uh, it, it did very well with the media. I'll give a couple of examples. But it never was quite the sensation of Bill Bennett's report, because as I put it once to Bill, his report was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And mine was about polychlorinated biphenyls. Who do you think is going to get more press attention, right? Uh, but it was about that same time. I wasn't the only person thinking this. I remember in 1995, Greg Easterbrook came out with his monumentally large book, A Moment on the Earth. And the subtitle uh, is The Coming Age of Environmental Optimism. And I think Greg was just 15 years too early. His book got savaged by environmentalists. For some reason, the Environmental Defense Fund uh, uh, took a, such a disliking to it that they set up an early website. This was still the early days of the internet. Nitpicking you know, factual claims and, and uh, uh, statistics that could be contested, an error here and there. Uh, but the sweeping point was the entire book should be discredited. Uh, because Easterbrook had written in the book, uh, environmental commentary is so fog bound in woe that few people realize measurable improvements have already been made in almost every area. He just couldn't say that then, uh, or not without uh, attracting widespread scorn. The Economist magazine at the time observed that suggesting the environment as a cause for optimism is beyond the pale of respectable discourse. Well, within a few years, you began to see the media taking notice. I remember in 2000, after I talked to the editorial board at USA Today, they talked about hidden environmental gains. They were hidden in plain sight. <laughs> you just need to look up the data. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, USA Today's format was always to have a point counterpoint. So Fred Krupp showed up to say, empty pleasure. Yeah, some things have improved, but things are still terrible. Uh, a lot of environmentalists can't take yes for an answer. Um, now, the other thing at the time that I made a, uh, not really a stink about, but you know, the United States still does not have a Bureau of Environmental Statistics to go along with the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Education Statistics. Uh, meanwhile, almost all of our European peer nations have a Bureau of Environmental Statistics and produce an, uh, annual reports on environmental trends and conditions in their countries, and we haven't. That did finally change with the EPA around 2006. They now have on their website that, of course, is huge and sprawling and it's hard to find things, but they have a report on the environment that um, pulls together the data on environmental problems, not just the ones that are under EPA jurisdiction, but from other uh, cabinet agencies and uh, other regulatory agencies in the government in you know, one-stop shopping. And nowadays, you can download the data sets in Excel if you want to analyze them. I mean, when I first started out 30 years ago, I had to do it the old-fashioned way. I had to go to the EPA Region 9 library in San Francisco and look up printed reports and enter the numbers in an Excel spreadsheet the old-fashioned way by hand. So it took a long time, but now all the data is available uh, for anyone uh, to uh, look at. Um, so that's a, a step forward, but we still don't have a Bureau of Environmental Statistics or any consistent reporting uh, format. I'll tell a little story about that. Uh, I teamed up for several years uh, in the aughts with Paul Portney, the longtime president of Resources for the Future, recommending that we ought to have a Bureau of Environmental Statistics. And we testify a couple times before the, uh, some House Committee on Government Administration. And environmentalists would show up to oppose the idea. And you know, I can be cynical about it, uh, but one, one of the persons who spoke against it one day said, well, we, we don't trust the Bush administration to do it fairly and straightforwardly. Which I thought odd, because it was the Bush OMB that had put out a big, thick report uh, about how massive the health benefits of the Clean Air Act were. I think they may have overestimated them, but apparently this was lost on environmentalists who thought you couldn't trust the, the Bush OMB. Under John Graham, who was always a fairly tough on regulatory analysis person, reaching that conclusion. But that's where we are. Um, the EPA started putting out this lovely chart every year, which could be summarized under the heading of decoupling, showing the, that you can have lots of economic growth, population growth, vehicle miles traveled and falling conventional air pollution, and here in the last few years, falling carbon dioxide emissions at the same time. I'll come back to that point, because I think it's an important one. Uh, today, I'm just going to go very quickly over a, a very few highlights uh, 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 
Today, uh, we see that the air pollution, the conventional six main air pollution uh, pollutants of the Clean Air Act era uh, have all fallen well below the national standards, which we keep lowering every so often. Um, and that's not uniform, of course. There are some stubborn pockets, like a couple of parts of Los Angeles. Um, but when I was a kid growing up in the 70s in the LA area, uh, LA, and I'm out in the San Gabriel Valley, two miles from the mountains, most of which I could never see most of the year. Today, you can see them all the time. Uh, but in those days, uh, we violated the old one-hour ozone standard about 200 days a year. And most of the LA basin now doesn't violate the old one-hour standard even one day a year. It, again, except with a couple of those pockets of Riverside, San Bernardino, and uh, Santa Clarita Valley. But even on their worst days, uh, their peak level of ozone, the worst of them, is, uh, uh, is less than half of what an average day was in Los Angeles in the 1970s. And a lot of this is the story of automobiles. Well, here's total volatile organic compounds. That's one of the precursors to ozone. And you know, that's the decline curve from 1970 to now. Uh, I like to point out that uh, it's really an automobile story. I like to say the real heroes of the Clean Air Act are not so much environmental lawyers and judges or even the EPA issuing mandates. Those all play a role. Uh, but the real heroes were the engineers who wore pocket protectors, who figured out how to redesign our entire uh, combustion systems for autos and lots of other things. Uh, the same story is true of nitrogen oxide emissions, both totally and from automobiles. Uh, and then, uh, OK, let's, let's sort of pause there. I, I can say a lot about the, um, that too thick. I could say a lot more about the whole uh, conventional air pollution story and power plants and coal and all the rest of that. But it is true that not everything has improved, or things that have improved have stalled out. Uh, for a long time, from the 50s to 70s, we were losing a lot of wetlands. We reversed that by uh, the beginning of the new century. And then in the last few years, we sort of backsliding a little bit. And of course, not all wetlands are created equal, and so you know the, the sort of subcategories are important as they are in so many things. Um, another area where we have made no progress at all would be hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, which really is a story of runoff from the huge Mississippi uh, River Basin. Here, you can implicate conflicting environmental policies. We'd like to get the uh, 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 area of hypoxia and nutrient runoff down. But we're also saying, let's have a ton of corn ethanol, which is exactly the wrong thing to do if you're really trying to control a, a runoff in the Mississippi Basin. Uh, I've got some old data showing that the general trend of nitrate loadings has been going up. A lot of that very choppy variation really does depend on how much rainfall there is in a year in the Mississippi Basin. Uh, a light rainfall year will have less. A heavy rainfall year will have more. But nonetheless, we're not having a lot of great progress there. I'm going to skip over that. That just shows you that our trends have been flat on um, nitrogen loadings into the Gulf. Other areas have shown better uh, performance, like the Chesapeake Bay nearby here, Long Island Sound, uh, Puget Sound, I think, although I haven't looked at Puget Sound data for quite a long time now. Um, let's see, page two here. Another interesting effort to do serious environmental analysis happened in 2006 when the Heinz Center uh, did the State of the Nation's Ecosystems. This was an extraordinary project involving about over 100 scientists of various specialties. And of course, one problem is, what's an ecosystem? They had worked very hard to define different kinds of ecosystems in different scales. An ecosystem can be as small as a petri dish or as large as the whole country. Uh, and they developed about 120 indicators of ecosystem condition. And what they found was they only had decent data for about half. Others, there was some data, but gaps. And so they could only draw conclusions about a few of the different uh, uh, ecosystem conditions they thought were important. Uh, and of that, you know, about 25% of them showed improvement. Others, just too much uncertainty. But above all, the, pro the, uh, the process of doing this took several years. We actually hosted Robin O'Malley, the project direct director for this project here at AEI, when this report came out, along with Tom Lovejoy from Princeton and some of the other leaders of it. It was so labor intensive that they didn't keep the project up, unfortunately. But it's the kind of intensive investigation you've seen a lot more of as environmental studies has matured in the last 20, 30 years. Um, 
other people are starting to get into the game, and I think maybe the turning point toward environmental optimism started with Bjorn Lomborg's book in 2000, 2000, I think it came out, 2001. And of course, it was very controversial, and you may remember that some Danish scientific committee formally charged Lomborg with scientific dishonesty. And I read the report, and I couldn't find a single factual claim disputed, although there were many factual claims in the book you could dispute, or hasty conclusions and so forth. And they ended up retracting that finding, but that shows you how politicized the matter still was. Uh, but that was just the beginning. By 2005, we have Jack Hollander, uh, of, of emeritus physicist from UC Berkeley, who described to me, by the way, that he got in the environment back in his days as a Bobby Kennedy liberal. This began to be a sign that environmental thought was now, uh, environmental optimism, was not only growing, but was more bipartisan. It wasn't limited to contrarians like Julian Simon or AEI's Ben Wattenberg, who used to talk a lot about environmental progress during his many years here. Uh, the one that especially jumped out at me was Seymour Gart, uh, not a very well-known person, so a professor of public health at the University of Pittsburgh, and he told the story of how he was at a conference one day of public health experts, and a speaker said, well, of course, you know, air pollution is falling almost everywhere, and he said, we all looked around each other. None of us had ever heard this. We didn't believe it. Uh, we'd never seen it reported anywhere. And that's when he decided, well, I'm going to look into this and similar, uh, uh, um, uh, similar trends. And that's where he came out with the surprising look at the real state of our planet. Uh, and we had uh, Seymour here at AEI to talk about this book, because whenever a book like this came out from some unexpected quarter, I thought, that person needs some attention. Um, and then. I think other notable figures, uh, Hans Rosling, who was a good friend, the late Hans Rosling, he died a few years ago too early, good friend of Nick Eberstadt here. Uh, and uh, he's a demographer who covers a lot of the waterfront, but environment was one of the issues he liked to talk about. And if you've never seen his Gapminder website, not just his, but he was one of the designers of Gapminder, it's this wonderfully interactive site where you can plug in from any databases for individual countries, or uh, and, and countless variables, and then generate these really wonderful animated graphics. Whenever I teach the subject, I make students learn how to use Gapminder and do various research projects. I think it's a fabulous uh, resource. Um, Hannah Ritchie uh, is just out with his brand new book. I haven't gotten into it yet. Not the end of the world. Uh, and you know, a, a, this is the kind of optimism that, as you know, the economist said at the time of Greg Easterbrook's book, was just simply not allowed. And now you see more and more, quote unquote, mainstream books like this. Hannah is part of this terrific project out of Oxford run by Max Roser called Our World in Data. If you don't know it or haven't seen it, you absolutely must. It does a whole lot of things too, but it does environmental issues on a global scale extremely well. Uh, there's also down the street from us, our friends at the Cato Institute have their project on human progress. It again covers the entire waterfront, but energy and environment is prominent among them. And then I want to mention uh, uh, Ted Nordhaus and Michael Schellenberger's book from almost 20 years ago, A Breakthrough. And Ted's going to be here tonight, actually, along with Roger, to talk about another aspect of the climate change story. Uh, but this began uh, a self-conscious new movement called eco-modernism. And to make a long story short, look up Eco-Modernist Manifesto online. It is explicitly anti-Malthusian, explicitly pro-technology, uh, and optimistic about the future. Uh, and I think it's one of the, it's something I, you, I never would have expected this even 10 years ago, uh, with a body of serious opinion behind it. Mention one other book that I think is a turning point. Matt mentioned you know, the population bomb in 1968, which curiously corresponded with the peak of fertility rates around the world, and that's when they started falling. An interesting bit of timing for that famous book. Uh, Matthew Connolly, a uh, historian at uh, Columbia University, published this book around 2010, I think. And it is a lacerating criticism, not just of sort of the Ehrlich outlook on population, but especially he's very critical of, in particular, the uh, Planned Parenthood International and their birth control efforts around the world, which were often quite coercive, and even in some cases violent. Uh, and you can't read that book without thinking, and the title really has it right, A Fatal Misconception. This is wrongly thought about. Again, an unthinkable book from Harvard University Press, 
uh, as recently, maybe as 1990. Uh, but there you have it. Finally, the old Malthusianism does die hard. There is a reaction has grown to the uh, eco-modernists, and there's now a self-styled degrowth movement. I haven't quite got my hands around it, because when you ask some of the people on Twitter, <laughs> which is where we conduct all important conversations these days, right? Uh, what they mean by degrowth, they'll, it's often confusing and contradictory. They'll say, we don't actually mean negative growth, just some different kind of growth. You know, it's, uh, you know we're back to sustainable development, which was the big phrase 20-some years ago, but it's kind of fallen out of fashion because it was so watery. Uh, but, uh, so that's going to go on. They never quite go away. Uh, the way I put it is, uh, the old Malthusian environmentalists are like people who've been to, alcoholics who've been to a 12-step program. They're determined to get sober and abandon Malthus, and then they walk by a well-lit Malthusian tavern and go on a bender. So uh, that's always going to be around. So where are we now with public opinion? You know, I began showing you that 30 years ago, the majorities of Americans thinking conditions were getting worse. Uh, and that we were running out of time. Here's the latest series from Gallup. Uh, Gallup, uh, by the way, more and more pollsters aren't even asking about the environment much anymore. Um, it used to be that people who do the exit poll consortium for elections, you know, they offer you seven or eight issues, you know, the economy, crime, terrorism, whatever. They used to ask about, is the environment one of your top two issues? I think they quit, Carlin Bowman may remember, I think they quit asking that question after 2002 because the number of voters who selected the environment as a top two issue is below 2%. In other words, below the margin of error. Uh, uh, but this one is kind of fun, because what you'll see is, uh, you know, large majorities here, uh, the green line, we think things are getting worse. And then suddenly, in 2009, that gap narrows, and the number of people who think the environment's getting better takes a conspicuous jump. Ah. Barack Obama was elected, and I hate to be cynical about it, but people apparently took literally that grandiose pronouncement that this will be the moment history records when the sea level stop rising, just because we elected him. Um, okay, so I, I think it's not news that a partisan division on the environment has opened up and been around for a very long time. <laughs> but, uh, oops, I didn't want to do that just yet. Um, I, want the, I want the laser, that one. So it stayed that way through the Obama years. Bounces up a little when Trump comes in and very ostentatiously takes us out of the Paris Climate Accord and so forth. Um, and then Joe Biden arrives here three years ago, and I keep doing that wrong. And you'll see that the, uh, um, the, the number of uh, people goes down. And Gallup's supposition in the latest poll is that it, uh, you know, it just reflects the Democrat-Republican divide. And, uh, Democrats and uh, you know, people inclined toward the environment are more suspicious when there's a Republican president and less so when there's a Democrat. Except then you see this last little tale at the end here. While Biden's still in office, what's going on here? Well, Gallup speculates, looking at their crosstabs, that that increase you're seeing there is actually coming from Republicans. They don't really explain why and what, but and I have a lot of thoughts about what that actually means. It might not mean exactly what you think it means, but it is kind of interesting and not expected, and actually might be a reason for optimism in the long term for ways that would take me a while to explain. But what I want to do is get to my asterisk. The big asterisk, of course, is climate change. And <clears throat> my proposition is that climate change has eaten environmentalism alive. And the reason I say that is if you bring up any of the other problems that deserve observation, serious policy work, you know, water quality of every kind, a loss of habitat area, um, uh, 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 toxic exposure, and so forth. Uh, what you often hear is climate change, it doesn't matter if things have gotten better, climate change is gonna stop all that and make everything worse. And therefore the solution to conventional air pollution, habitat destruction, forest loss, whatever, is we have to get rid of fossil fuels. And you know, we have to solve, if we solve climate change, we'll solve everything else. Uh, which seems quite wrong-headed to me, but to cover that part of the waterfront, I want to defer now to Roger Pielke. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess I'll just sit down over here. I don't know if we use the same one or not. But <clears throat> we'll see, we'll see. 
All right, well, good morning. Hello, everybody online. Um, I'll tell a quick story about Steve, and it's great to be here with Steve and sit here. A, a decade ago, about Steve was on the, uh, spent a year at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I think he had the latitude to choose what department he sat in, so he chose to sat, sit in my department, Environmental Studies Department. I remember when he was wrapping up his, his year, he told me, he said, when I first came, I was worried that I'd come to an Environmental Studies Department in Boulder, Colorado, and it would be politics this, politics that, politics this. And he said, when I went to the faculty meetings, it was who gets what office, who has what teaching load assignments, and it was just boring, and yeah, we're academics, we know how that goes. It's, it's not like that everywhere anymore. Um, so my talk is, is, is gonna be shorter, narrower, and deeper than Steve's. Uh, I'm gonna talk about climate change. First, I wanna show, this is me um, marching in Earth Day uh, parade. Uh, I, I, near as I can tell, it's like 1973. Um, you can see from my smile, I was an environmental optimist back then also. Um, all right, so let me start with uh, John Kerry. And um, as everyone knows, uh, John Kerry has been a longtime advocate on climate change. And I'm gonna posit these two statements that he made just two years apart, almost to the day. Um, he said uh, in 2021, currently, we're, we're, as we're talking, we are regrettably on course to hit somewhere between three, four degrees at the current rate. He's talking about projected global average temperature rise to 2100. But then just two years later, obviously the same sort of speech, um, there was a, a change made. We're currently heading towards something like 2.4 or 2.5 degrees of warming on the planet. Again, to 2100 um, for global average temperature rise. That's a change of a significant amount from three or four degrees to 2.4 degrees. Um, and so it'd be fair to ask, you know, what changed? And let me say, all props to John Kerry. Um, he's accurately reflecting the science here when many people still have not. Um, if you ask Mr. Kerry what changed, um, he said just recently, we're heading towards about 2.5 degrees right now. When I took this job on, we were headed towards four degrees. <laughs> well, that's not exactly correct. Um, and so what I want to do is tell you why perspectives have changed, like reflected here by, by Mr. Kerry. Um, I call it the best kept secret in climate science. Um, everyone in and around climate science knows everything I'm going to tell you right now. Most people do not. All right, this is a spaghetti diagram, and let me just take a moment to explain it to you. Um, these are carbon dioxide emissions from burning fossil fuels. And the black line here is history, and all of this spaghetti, this colorful spaghetti, are projections that were developed um, really starting about 20 years ago for how the future might play out under different scenarios. Climate science is based on scenarios of the future, um, which are super complicated. They have aspects of the economics, of population growth, of energy consumption, energy production, land use, and on and on. Um, this figure shows about 1,200 scenarios that were developed in the literature um, back then. And obviously, the world um, scientists cannot deal with 1,200 scenarios. We had to simplify. So at the time, this is 2005, they said, all right, let's pick four scenarios, and that'll be the focus of our research. And these have these names, they're called RCPs, details aren't so important. But they said at the time, well, let's have a high one, we've got to have a high one. Let's have a low one, that's the blue one down there, the 2.6. Then they said, let's have two in the middle. They didn't want one in the middle because they said everyone's going to focus on that one. Um, so let's have two in the middle. And it turns out at that time, this high one, RCP 8.5, um, for a lot of reasons, was designated business as usual. This is where the world is heading. You can see, or maybe you can't see, here's the temperature rise of 2100. Here it's 3.2 to 5.4 degrees Celsius. This is where John Kerry got that three, four degrees Celsius that he was repeating again in 2021. So what has changed? All right, so what I'm doing here on this graph is I've taken um, Every one of these spaghetti scenarios, and this is with my colleagues Matt Burgess and, uh, at Colorado and Justin Ritchie at British Columbia. Um, this is recently published for anybody who wants a copy. Um, it's wonderful reading. Um, we took each of those scenarios and we just plotted them on this graph. This is total fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions all added up to 2100 on the x-axis. 
And then on the vertical axis is temperature change to 2100. So as pretty much everyone understands, the increased carbon dioxide, you increase temperature. Um, it's not exactly linear, but it's pretty darn close. So you have the extreme scenarios out here, the less extreme down here, consistent with the Paris Agreement. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in, in, its, in its doing its job, it says, um, when we use emission scenarios, they have to be plausible. They have to be capable of occurring in the real world. So I use this green oval and I drew a circle around all these because these are the 2005 to 2010 scenarios that were developed. Because the IPCC put it into their database, we can conclude they thought they were all plausible. So what I and my colleagues did is we said, all right, a lot of time has passed since 2005. This was a couple years ago. Um, we know what has happened with emissions. So we can compare the real world to what the emission scenarios actually put forward. The other thing we can do is that the, the energy system modelers, like the International Energy Agency and some of the fossil fuel companies and the US Energy Information Agency, they produce short-term energy outlooks. These are updated every year, not every couple decades like these scenarios. Um, and so they're the best view into what's gonna happen next year, the year after the next five years, the next 10 years. And so we asked the question, of this big body of 1,200 scenarios, which ones survived the test of A, reality, and B, where we think we're headed today, rather than 2005? Here's the answer. All of the scenarios that survived the test of reality on the test of near-term projections um, sit between two and three degrees. And in our study, the plausible scenarios were centered on 2.2 degrees uh, Celsius change by 2100. Um, this narrowing of expectations is perfectly normal. It happens in research. If you have long-term scenarios, as time goes on, some of them will survive and some of them will fall out. Uh, economists know this. Anyone who deals with data and projections knows the future is a difficult place to, to predict and it doesn't always evolve as we think. So let me go back to the spaghetti diagram. If we, if we apply this test of plausibility, we find that these very extreme scenarios um, are implausible. In fact, this business as usual RCP 8.5 is already falsified. And just to give you a sense of how ridiculous it is, it assumes that the world is going to build something like 30,000 new coal-fired power plants by 2100. There's about 6,000 in the world right now. Um, sure, some countries are building more, India and China in particular, but many countries are going off of coal, particularly in the European Union, um, in, here in the United States, where we're on track to be out of the coal business in the early 2030s. And so once we look at these plausible scenarios, um, based on where we sit today, the world looks a lot different. And let me say, this is not a unique view just to me and my colleagues. Um, we happen to be um, one of many researchers around the world. This is a figure that's put together uh, by Zeke Hausfather, um, very helpfully. And it's in time order um, of publication. You can't see it, but it starts in 2019, goes to 2021. Here's our study this, with this gray bar between two and three degrees. And these uh, different publications have different projections of temperature out to 2100, assuming different policy paths and so on. But one of the things that you can see is that five degrees is way up here. Four degrees is here. There's no more studies in there. So when John Kerry was saying that it looks like the world is heading for something like 2.4, 2.5 degrees by 2100, he was accurately reflecting the state of scientific understandings now. Now, if you go to the major media, if you go to the Biden administration's projections on the costs of climate change uh, under the social cost of carbon, you're gonna find that old extreme scenario, RCP 8.5, dominates public discussion. So there is an enormous dissonance out there. The old, outdated scenario, the climate apocalypse scenario, still has a firm hold on public discourse. It has a firm hold in the media, and it appears almost all the time in policy. Uh, Jan, John Kerry is interesting because he stands kind of alone out there um, among policymakers and politicians uh, in accurately reflecting the science. 
The IEA came out in 2023, and I, I'm pretty sure this is where John Kerry's 2.4 degrees came from. And you see it slices right through all these studies. Um, this is the new scientific consensus on climate change. I mentioned that everybody knows about this. So last summer in Reading, England, uh, about 50 of the world's scenario experts that create the scenarios that inform the IPCC, they gathered at a workshop to create um, abstract art. No, they didn't. Um, they, they, they gathered at the workshop to develop the next generation of scenarios. Um, and this is a big problem for climate research and climate policy. Because once scenarios are created, they last for 20 years. And I can tell you the scenarios that we create this year are going to be out of date in a couple years. Um, and so there needs to be some rethinking. We need to be more like the, the energy system modelers and update scenarios every year. Anyway, they came up with uh, a proposal for a new set of scenarios. They took these extreme scenarios and they put them in this, this hatched uh, projection here. They call it the emissions world avoided. Um, we could have a debate whether it's the world avoided or we were just plain wrong. Um, what I did is I took this, this graphic and I tried to turn it less into abstract art and more into something consistent with what I just showed you. So up here, we there's that RCP 8.5. You can see between four and five degrees. This is where we thought we were headed. This new abstract art set of scenarios doesn't even touch it, doesn't come close to it. The, the, the climate science community um, is well aware of this. There is going to be a profound reckoning in public discourse and discussions when the world realizes that where we're headed is lower than what just a few years ago was called a success story on climate change. So let me just conclude, and I look forward to having a discussion with everyone. Um, climate change is real. It is a problem. Um, but in recent years, our understandings of how future emissions uh, are going to evolve uh, has changed. And the good news, it's become much less extreme. And that's good news, and we should be able to comment on that good news um, while at the same time recognizing there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, here's how you can find me for any questions or comments, and I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you. Do we want to go straight to questions, or? I don't, I, I mean, don't know. What do you well, want to do? I don't care. <laughs> one, I mean, uh, um, let's, let's go to questions. We've heard a lot from us. Yeah, see, we've got some online ones. We'll, we'll let Mike handle yeah. the, the mic. We've got someone over here, I think. Yeah, OK, here we go. Guy's got the mic. Guy's got a mic, working mic, right. OK, my name's Joe Freeman, and I have two LA questions. Oh. Because I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in the 50s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when we burned trash in the backyard. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so question number one, <coughs> when did LA stop being Smogsville, or at least not as much of one as it was? OK, and question number two, has anyone done any long range studies of long range health effects on those of us who grew up in Smogsville? <gasps> yeah, great question. So. I mean, the LA story is a, a, a it, it didn't happen overnight. It happened very slowly. Uh, I used to have the data memorized of when things peaked, which was the late 60s, early 70s. But things didn't really start dropping substantially till the late 80s into the 90s, and then really started going down fast by the year 2000 and since then. Um, one of the things about the Clean Air Act generally is that uh, it, was, it was well understood, I think as early as the 50s, that Los Angeles had a big problem with carbon monoxide. You know, at that time, you know, ozone, photochemical smog, wasn't that well understood, believe it or not, and in some small respects still isn't. That's a long story. But, uh, but then once the Clean Air Act passed, we started monitoring the whole country. We were, just, we were surprised to discover that Milwaukee and other places that were never as bad as LA also had elevated levels of carbon monoxide. OK. Um, there have been some studies, that the Lancet did one on asthma in around 2002 that I, th I thought was kind of mixed. And there's another study recently, I can't remember the citation, but um, I, I guess what I'd say is, uh, I mean, I certainly remember as a kid, you couldn't play outside in the afternoon in the summer because your lungs would just burn and hurt. And I, you know, I grew up in a wealthy suburb, everybody had these glorious swimming pools, you couldn't go swimming because you, you, 
within 15 minutes, you would be gasping for breath, and you'd be, it was in pain, right? And, uh, uh, and, you know, I was a track athlete in the 70s, and I can't believe they let us run. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable uh, uh, to look back on that now. Um, that's a really, I mean, that's an intricate question. I think that the, uh, the, there's a range of opinion on that. I've seen a few studies thought that the health effects were overestimated, that were more resilient than we might think. It's like people who quit smoking, their health improves. So I'm, I'm sort of agnostic about that. And there's unquestionably health benefits, especially from getting lead out of the air, but that's also a national story. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I think we're still waiting for long-term data about L.A. from, you know, people our age and also the younger cohort coming up. Are they going to have lower incidence of asthma and, you know, other respiratory diseases and lifespans? I think we don't know yet. I'm convinced the sign will be positive very strongly, though. Was it? Oh, Mark. Mark Mills. Mark Mills with the National Center for Energy Analytics. Uh, right. Gentlemen, uh, w would you speculate on, on what form and when the reckoning will happen? Because I think this is uh, relevant to both of your views. Do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to. You know, this is one of those where um, things change in underlying scientific understandings, and it can take a really long time for that to percolate um, into the future. So I, I will go back to the, the, the population bomb that was mentioned yeah. a number of times. You know, you don't hear people, you, you can find them, but you don't hear it um, pronounced like it was in the 1960s, 1970s, about the population crisis. And so we might say, well, when did the reckoning happen on the population crisis? And the reality, I think, is it never did. We just kind of moved on, and other issues like climate change took, took its place. I think it's conceivable that, that in my children's generation, climate change will still be there. It'll be around as an issue. Um, but it'll be a lot like how we think about population today. Yeah, population matters. It's important. Um, population policies don't exist as population policies. Um, but we talk about health care, we talk about education, we talk about women's rights, which are all relevant to population. So I do think that there's, uh, the, you know, my leading candidate is that um, New understandings quietly replace the old without people saying, uh, oh, we were wrong about that. No one, I mean, Paul Ehrlich was just on 60 Minutes last year <laughs> talking about the same things that he, that he used to talk about. Um, I have noticed, I have noticed that as, as this new understanding does start to be discussed, and it has been discussed to some degree, the, the, the storyline is we're being successful on climate policy. All of the decisions we've made, the Paris Agreement, have led us to bend the curve. Um, and I, that's another talk in more detail. I don't think it, it has yet. I think the, the real story is that we adopted as the leading scenario a flawed scenario. And it defeats the whole purpose of scenario planning. Right? Scenario planning is based on the assumption, we don't know the future. We need to consider a wide range. And so we bet on one that was politically convenient for alarmist narratives. Um, but not particularly realistic. Quickly, I share your view on that with one, one caveat. None of the other scenarios which came passe had roughly a trillion dollars a year of spending programs. Mm. The spending programs in place in the EU and US. So we have these massive entitlements and direct spending it's mandates and subsidies that are unprecedented. We didn't have it for po population control. Oh. Well, well, I mean, as, as you know, Matthew Connolly says in his book, uh, Fatal Misconception, um, which I also recommend, there was a lot of bad things done in the name of population policy for a long time. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very much of the view, view is that good or bad policy doesn't emerge from scientific understandings. And so um, one of the things that, that I'm pretty sure of is that, that Politics is self-correcting, maybe in some cases on a faster time scale than is science. Um, and as we see, as people feel the consequences of higher price energy, whether they're in France or Nigeria or the United States, they, they, they lash out. I mean, and you can see farmers you know, taking action in Europe just, um, just in the most recent months. So I, I do think that um, 
you know, I, there's one thing that I've written about um, in my book, The Climate Fix, it's called uh, The Iron Law of Climate, which is that people respond to economics and they don't like higher price energy. So um, if, if the subsidies that are put in place, whether in the United States or Europe, do not lead to accelerated economic growth, better per capita standards of living, obvious improvements, better technologies, and so on, those policies won't sustain. Now, is it true that those policies could have some inefficiencies and have some problems in the, in the shorter term? Absolutely. Um, I don't think that's unique to climate or environmental issues, uh, actually. Yeah, my, my answer is substantially the same. I don't think you ever get a reckoning on just about anything, but you do see those slow changes. And the population one is a good comparison. Uh, like the emissions forecast Roger points to, uh, I used to, Ben Wattmer put me on this 20 years ago. It used to be that the UN Population Agency would do every year, or every other year, uh, you know, century-long predictions of population growth rates, and they have a high case, middle, and low one. And over the last 25 years or so, uh, the highest case is now lower than what the lowest case used to be. So year by year, that changes. And you, you, you know, now it's not unusual to see the New York Times saying is a, a birth dearth Ben Wattenberg, again, was on to this 25 years ago, saying our big problem is going to be too low fertility rates. Well, now that is an, a proposition entertained by the New York Times. So I think the, the way I think of it is, um, uh, oh, I'll mention about the politics in a minute, is um, I think what will happen by degrees is that climate change, like many other environmental issues, will become a normal issue. It won't go away. But it won't be this extraordinary, you know, the climate crisis is now sort of the AP style book says, use climate crisis in your news stories about climate. OK. Um, the population one, the politics are a little different. But I had a student ask me about this recently. Uh, and I thought, well, this is unusual, because that's like you know, a question from my student days, which is you know, around the time of the Boer War, it seems like now. <laughs> uh, back in little known episode, back around 1970 or 71, when you know, the first Earth Day is happening and all the new NEPA and all the legislation is booming on the scene, uh, Nelson Rockefeller persuaded Nixon that you need to have a population policy. So Nixon set up, I think it might have been a formal presidential commission, like the Grace Commission and others that happen now and then. Should the United States have a, a population policy to limit population growth and what it would be like? So they commissioned some papers, they have some meetings, and somebody raised their hand one day and said, do you realize that if we have a population policy in this country, it will disproportionately affect minorities because they have the highest fertility rates. And that commission was never heard from again. <laughs> it just quietly disappeared, and now it does, you, know, you, could, you have to work really hard to find this, right? So that kind of is a certain echo of current policies, right? Uh, or, or current, you know, political currents. Um, and so, you know, that uh, the last point, that, that poll I showed that showed this uptick that the Gallup people, Lydia Saad, thinks is actually Republicans. That, in my mind, is kind of a hopeful sign in the sense I'm just saying that it might mean that environmentalism or environmental issues, including climate, will start to reset in normal. And something looks more normal, that like, you know, like education, health care. We fight like cats and dogs over that. But the point is, both parties do fight about it in ways of trying to look for solutions and play in the game. And just one last anecdote. I you know, remember, oh gosh, almost 30 years ago now, I get invited to the Republican National Committee's meeting of Team 100. That was their $100,000 donors. Or as today, RNC would say, small donors. <laughs> right. Uh, and I give a talk on the environment. And I sort of go through sort of these, and a bunch of people said, oh, that's all very interesting. But why are we talking about their issue? And that's when my head hits the table and go, you, you know, no, that's not. OK, you get the point. Uh, so when the two parties compete for an issue, that's when we make the most policy progress, even though nobody's happy about it at, at any particular moment. Oh, ah. uh, JP Hogan, it's a few questions in one, but <clears throat> on the sign in 2006, they started doing the EU, EU and the US did a lot of cutting of CO2 tyrannically, I guess, but um, so we had the reductions while then China and India increased. So we had a flipping of the daily greenhouse effect from one side of the northern hemisphere to the other that is almost a man-made climate change from the cuts. So I wasn't sure where your science is. I was always annoyed that they weren't like controlling their solutions and checking the science on whether their solutions were causing problems. Do you have studies on where that flipping has caused weather changes. Um, that's, um, so that would be the first question. Um, 
I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, I mean, on the science of climate change and the, the effects of, of carbon dioxide cuts, I mean, the, the answer is that if you take a look at the, the historical record of carbon dioxide accumulating in the atmosphere, and it is the whole atmosphere, not where it's produced, um, it's been going up, 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 up. There's a seasonal cycle. Um, if you take a look at the data, um, there has been actions taken, but the global rate of decarbonization, which is carbon dioxide per unit of GDP, um, has been pretty much linear for the last 50 years. So carbon dioxide emissions have not peaked. They're not going down. Um, in some places, they are going down. The, as you say correctly, the United States um, saw its, its peak in emissions in 2005. Um, and it's gone down since then, but largely due to the deployment of renewables, solar and wind, but also, um, probably more significantly, natural gas from fracking um, has displaced coal. Um, in Europe, it's been similar. Um, the biggest advance in, um, in carbon-free energy was actually deployment was in France in the 1980s with nuclear power. So um, there are predictions. The International Energy Agency thinks we're going to peak all the fossil fuels by 2030. Uh, we will see. But as of this moment, there's no reason to expect that climate policies, as climate policy focused on emissions, have any discernible influence on the climate system. Um, a while ago, I met a NASA engineer, and he said, oh, well, the CO2 isn't escaping. And what came to mind was, well, it used to go through an ozone hole. So <laughs> <laughs> we're having heard a scientist say, well, it isn't escaping. How did it used to escape? Um, and was, is, was, was an ozone hole helping CO2 escape where it built up? Yeah, the, I mean, the short answer is, is no. Um, the CO2, when it's emitted um, for purposes of human society and the climate system, uh, CO2 is in the atmosphere for, for not forever, but from a policy standpoint, it might as well be. So, thank you. Rui has a... Uh, Rui Teixeira, um, what I'm curious about and what I worry about is not that I think these, you know, sort of the median model can go down to like 2.4 degrees or 2.3 degrees and that could be a more widespread understanding, but it's not clear to me that this will have any effect on the climate debate at all because, you know, there's a built-in, you know, button that can be pushed on this issue constantly, which is weather. Right, the weather attribution industry is like <laughs> incredibly powerful. It gemini's huge sections of the Democratic Party, massive interest groups. There's foundations putting hundreds of billions. And what do they have to point to at this point? They can always point to the weather. There's always something going on. And they're, and the dialogue at this point, and in the sort of overall immediate, completely impervious to what the actual underlying findings from the IPCC are in these weather uh, trends and weather events, as you written about in your blog and in other places. So I guess I, I just saying I, I'm not sure that, you know, a bit more common sense than what the models really say is actually going to have that much effect and that the real problem is, you know, the weather attribution thing. There's always going to be something going on. Like the, the ocean, look, look at how hot it's been this last year. Unbelievable. This is so extreme. We're all about to blow up. So what do you do about that? I mean, I know you're going to address it. Uh, maybe Oof. later today, but I won't be here, so I wanted to ask this. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you're here at 6 o'clock tonight, uh, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> it's a great question, and of course you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the other responses to this changing perspectives um, that is out there is that, that advocates, the, the, lang the apocalyptic language they used to use to describe 4 or 5 degrees Celsius, they just recalibrated and said, oh my gosh, it's at 2 Celsius now, okay? Um, the, the weather attribution industry, so, so that's a technical term, but that means something happened, can we pin it on a cause? And usually the cause is in emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, it's really interesting because the, the science of so-called attribution has departed from the, you know, the so-called gold standard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for a long time now. Um, the, the IPCC has been um, pretty stalwart, and, and I have a lot of respect for them, I have called things straight on extreme weather. Um, most of the policy world, the advocacy world, the journalistic world has decided to ignore the IPCC. Um, so there's been people to fill that gap. There's a new industry of, of weather attribution. Um, there's good work by people like Nico Stair, Hans von Storch, um, Mike Hume, um, who have looked at 
how we think of climate going back 150 years. And it turns out there's, there's really, I mean, we have a different media, media ecosystem now, but there's really not that's changed in how we see portents in the weather. Um, it used to be, you know, <laughs> drought follows the plow from the time the, that the, uh, we were colonizing the American West. Um, the idea that when you farm, it, ca it brings drought, and we're causing it. It's, it's our fault. Um, so I don't know that that ever goes away. Um, and there, um, every, time, every time there's a weather event um, anywhere in the world, and extreme weather is actually normal on planet Earth, so you actually <laughs> have to go into the statistics to identify changes. It's pinned right now on human-caused climate change. Um, and I ex fully expect that to continue. That'll be a tool of advocacy. Um, going forward, and smart climate and energy policies are going to have to be put in place in that context, because I don't think it's going to go away. Yeah, you know, really, I have, I have for the longest time, and still to a certain extent, tried to resist making the comparison to a lot of environmental activism to religion. I just thought, I, I prefer to stick with the data and, you know, right, and, uh, and the objective realities of the world uh, and not traffic in what can quickly become a just an overgeneralization. It's getting harder and harder all the time. Uh, because, well, i give a couple of anecdotes. I, I, uh, um, people often ask me, why are, for years, why are environmentalists so gloomy? Say, because it makes them happy. <laughs> I actually kind of believe this. It's, you know, it's a, a secular apocalypse without the promise of redemption. But then, equally obvious is, there is very much the, 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 you know, the heretics vibe about it, right? I mean, so, I mean, I, you know, I wrote an article, I was a cover story for the Weekly Standard when it still existed about Jay Faison, a Republican, made his money in electronics, wants to do something on climate, but he didn't subscribe to the party line, so Tom Steyer had to damn him in the New York Times. It's like, no, here's a person who's halfway with you, but he's a hair, and Tom Steyer who made Roger's life miserable behind the scenes, as we know. So there's this demand for absolute conformity to, uh, I hate to say it, a religious orthodoxy, and I don't know if that's ever going to end or not. Um, and... I, you know, that, that seems to me as a sociological matter is very much evident and it drives a lot of the, a lot of the trends Roger pointed to and I think it's a shame. And it's gonna go away, it's some, or maybe it'll be something new, right? I, so I, actually it was, uh, Brett Stevens, the Wall Street Journal when he was still there said, climate change may go away someday, what, something must replace it. And my nominee was, you may every once in a while hear a story of the news about how the polar magnetic poles are weakening or moving a bit and if they actually collapse, it is a, apparently a really big calamity for the planet. Uh, surely they will figure out a way to blame it on human activity, you know, the electricity grid or something. Um, hasn't happened yet, but that would be my nominee for what will replace it. For people who really like apocalyptic thinking, because I think human beings may be hardwired for some element of eschatology and apocalyptic thinking. And once conventional religion starts to erode, as it's been doing for 200 years, what replaces it? Well, let me, let me add to that. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, folks in insurance and reinsurance. Mm. And I've noticed in the last few years, um, not out in public and, and not in the, um, in, in the discussions out in, in, in front of people, but these are folks who, who, who make and lose money based on their bets on the weather. Yeah. And one of the things that um, I've seen is more realism in the closed door discussions over trends in weather. So for example, I was at Lloyd's of London last fall um, we were at a Chatham House rule event, um, and the, the head of, uh, of disasters, and I can violate Chatham rule because it was published in the Financial Times later, um, <laughs> she, said, she said, you know, we believe in climate change, we think it's real, it's serious, but we haven't seen its effect on our portfolio management. Um, and so that was headlined in the Financial Times a couple months later, where the Financial Times said, head of Lloyd's of London, you know, you know private meeting says, exactly that. Um, I do think if you're someone who manages risk that's related to accurately understanding climate and weather trends, um, people are starting to realize you can't get caught up in the hype in the public discussions. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect we may have a, a two-path dialogue going on. There's the public dialogue, and you know, as you say, it's, you know, if, you know, it's, it's cold today, that's climate change. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's part of the, the, the spirit of the times. Um, but I think for people who make decisions where they have to know, you know, I'm, I'm putting in, you know, $100 million worth of agricultural product this year, I have to have a good understanding of El Nino, La Nina, 
those sort of decisions will necessarily be grounded in reality. I guess add just quickly, I saw a headline yesterday. I'll try and find it for you. I forget it was Reuters or somewhere, and it said, uh, insurance companies charging higher premiums for climate risk and making huge profits. And I thought, I wonder if they connect the first. <laughs> Why? Okay, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah there's. Uh... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Gwydion Prince from London, with apologies for being late, complications with aeroplanes and things. Mm. Two brief comments and then a question, if I may. The comment first to you, Stephen. Um, and all of this is to do with framing and the nature of the moment we're currently in. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely on the money. We'll, the apocalyptic religion analogy is more than an analogy. But there's another which is closely associated, which is bankruptcy. And typically, people who are going bankrupt are the last people who know they're going bankrupt. <laughs> and as you know, the saying goes, when you go bankrupt, you go bankrupt slowly first and then suddenly. Right. So there is a collapse dynamic uh, about these sorts of <coughs> belief structures, specifically if they're misframed. In other words, if somebody's actually fundamentally misunderstood the nature of the problem. The second is to the question that was asked over here, which is about what happened last year. Well, Mother Nature, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, is sometimes bountiful to us, and she's just given us this magnificent, worked example of what produces global warming. And it wasn't systemic. It was a weather event. It was a combination of HTHH, the volcano, which increased the water vapor in the atmosphere by 10%. Uh, it was a big El Nino, and it was a solar maximum. You don't need more stresses to produce what happened during last year. And I, by the way, in London and in the groups which I'm in, I've noticed a significant early movement beginning, which is that there is a mouse of doubt creeping into the minds, even of the most uh, fanatical, that firstly, they're not breaking through with the public. And secondly, maybe actually, there is a big difference between climate and weather. And with all due respect, I think that you were Roger, in one or two of those answers, eliding the two. And I think maybe, here's my question, maybe it's time for us to be a bit more severe with ourselves and systematically to divide climate, which is a wicked problem, and weather, which is a much more bounded problem. Uh, this is where we all came in 25 years ago. And I, I live not very far away from the Met Office, and I do occasionally interact with them, and that's the seat of the religion in my country. Uh, and I do notice the mouse of doubt is beginning to creep also because, of course, why are we in this mess? It's because of the misapplication of weather models to, to, to climate, as we all know. So what last year showed us supports what we know from the long-term record, which is that there is a relationship between CO2 and temperature, except it doesn't actually work the right way around because the temperature goes up before the CO2 goes up. This suggests that it's not really that causal. And so we have to, I would suggest, start to ask ourselves fundamental questions which some of us began 20 odd years ago, and then they became completely taboo because that mm. meant that you were a denier and you were a this and a that, and you are you were an apostate. The religious analogy is correct. We, and I merely report, I mean, there is, I've been in discussions in the last six months which I've not been in for the last 20 years, people are beginning to realize that climate change as an issue, which is about to be inscribed by my next government and will bankrupt the country if they do it, this actually is going to bankrupt us, back to my first observation. So are we, given our responsibilities in an organization like this, which is to be ahead of the curve, is it time now to take a deep breath and to consider whether we've been too uh, genuflecting to the general framing because of the fear of all of those accusations which are out there. Maybe it's time for us to go back. Climate the movie is quite helpful in this regard, isn't it? So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, I, for a long time, and, and Gwyn, it's great to see you. Um, welcome to Washington. Um, for a long time, I, I've argued that arguments over climate science um, are probably the least productive way we can address issues of energy policy and climate policy. Uh, people are, can have legitimate views here or there. Um, the core understandings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have accurately reflected the core understandings of the climate community going back 30 years. And these haven't changed. And this is, this is something that I think 
um, we should really take note of um, is that climate science doesn't turn on a dime. We don't change our understandings today, tomorrow. Um, we've known what we've known for a long time. Um, but we also know that if we don't have uh, low price energy, expanding energy access in parts of the world, energy security pretty much everywhere, um, we're not going to make good decisions about energy. So um, the other thing to understand is that the world has been decarbonizing for a century. And so when we talk about mitigation policy and climate policy, what we're talking about is accelerating a trend that's well been in place. We will achieve absolutely nothing on energy policy by arguing finer points of climate science. I, you know, Call me up after the hundreds of studies are, are published on the Hunga Tonga volcano and tell me what they find. My views on adapting to extreme weather or mitigating climate change are not going to change based on any of those studies or any 100 of those studies. So I mean, I appreciate the, that there, there's interest in these topics. But for me, um, finer details of climate science, as interesting as they are, you know, hi, dad, um, are, 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 are not where the action is. <laughs> yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, profess, uh, admit to being negligent. I've quit following climate science intensively. I used to try and read large chunks of the what I thought were the most relevant chapters of the IPCC reports that came out every few years, and they're, you know, they're difficult for non-specialists, and I think even for a specialist. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm like you, I'm sort of amazed they're able to put together a report of that size yeah. at all. Uh, and I agree that they mostly play it straight. I mean, actually, I think the scientists who do the main chapters do play it straight, and then it's the summaries. That's where okay where the mischief enters. Uh, and the energy question is much more important because we're doing that. And that's also a little more approachable for the layperson. So uh, I think, so I'm going to tie two things together here. I mean, I'm only following British politics from afar, but my perception is, is that the net zero pledge of the Tory government is one of the things that's gotten into such deep trouble in heading for a landslide wipeout after a landslide triumph four years ago. That's a real case study of political incompetence across the board. But I, I keep hearing that net zero is one part of it, and here and there I'll read stories of the Labor Party exploiting this. And it's not clear to me, I may, may be right that uh, the Labor Party will be just as committed to uh, you know, a general net zero goal. More, so. more so, you think? Really? OK. But then, then I read Rui the other day. I actually haven't read your latest piece. It's in my reading queue about uh, what is it, why liberals are going to uh, embrace ener realist. energy realists. Right. Uh, I, I, my. Again, I'm loath to make predictions, too. But I think we're going to look back on, especially in this country, I think we're going to conclude that we're overdoing it with wind and solar now, uh, that it was a high price to pay for. Not that great of improvements, I think. But we'll, you know, we'll just have to see. I'll say the last thing. Uh, one thing I never expected to see, well, two things that are related. Two things I never thought I'd see in California specifically and more broadly are more and more you might call old-fashioned mainstream environmentalists saying, we made a mistake on nuclear power 40 years ago. Uh, and, and then second in California, is uh, uh, which, which invented sort of anti-growth land use policies 50 years ago, there's now a very left-wing uh, dominated what's called the YIMBY movement. And they're, uh, yes, in my backyard. And these are people who are typical left-wing organizing efforts and energy and all the rest of that are saying, Good grief, we've got to get rid of a lot of land use and housing regulations. They're just strangling affordable housing. I never thought I'd see that. And yet, we have both of those things happening. That's a little bit of reason for optimism, I think. Let me, uh, I'm going to comment on Rui's piece on why like, liberals are going to be energy realists with a real world example, picking up on this and, and addressing this point. So, I live in Boulder, Colorado. Wonderful place. <laughs> um, probably one of the most liberal places yeah. on this continent. Um, so, about two weeks ago, um, there was a forecasted windstorm, and just several years ago, there was a big fire, burned 1,000 houses uh, just outside of Boulder. And so the local power provider, Excel Energy, um, who has fears of liability, said, OK, you don't want any fires from power lines down. We're going to shut down the, the electricity in Boulder. And they shut it down for two days. And everyone I know, everyone I spoke to, the response was, this is unacceptable. This, this is not going to happen. And huge complaints. We had a, convert, a lot of energy realists were born that weekend. <laughs> um, and so the reality is, and, and, and again, I think politics is going to be self-correcting. The UK is an example. Germany is an example. There may be uh, some significant short-term damage done. But people are not going to sit by and let their economies go bankrupt. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. Um, and so if there are disastrous 
policies or politicians. Liz Truss, for example, and there are consequences economically, you will see a backlash. Um, the frustrating thing, of course, is that democracy is very blunt instrument, mm. and that correction can take a long time, and it's, it's not precise. This is why I think policy matters, and, and I know it's not popular in the era of politics, <laughs> but this is why you know, eggheads and wonks need to have good ideas, good plans in place, so when that moment comes, when people are dissatisfied, it's not let's just put the other political party in power. Somebody needs to have the good ideas. And so I think um, this is why I'm, I focus you know, kind of like a laser on energy rather than on climate, because I don't think we have smart energy policies just waiting on the shelf to hand to, to policymakers. When that moment opens up and we have a, a chance to change policy course. Well, it's, it's, it's not binary. It's not right. binary. My question is about whether we need to open right. the aperture. This is a slightly broader question, but uh, there's been a lot of pushback against ESG. Do you think it's basically just gone underground in corporate America, the environmental part of it? <coughs> um, yes. Uh, I say underground. I mean, uh, these things tend to reinvent themselves. So, uh, uh, again, back around 2000, the big enthusiasm for corporations was the triple bottom line. Well, that was just the early version of ESG. It was, you know, uh, I, for, I forget what the three parts were, but it was just ordinary profit. But the two other ones were, you know, doing good and, and it's exactly the same as ESG. But it, it, it didn't, you know, there's a there was a uh, environmental sustainability index as part of the Dow Jones, which I think still exists, but no one pays much attention to it. <coughs> so when ESG came along, uh, I thought, oh, it's the same thing with the new label, and there's been a very swift backlash to it, uh, as you've seen, and. So it'll still be around, you know, your public affairs uh, and environmental uh, uh, compliance, uh, uh, you know, units and big corporations. They're, you know, they're sort of down with the underlying ideas behind them. So I don't know if it will come back as prominently with a big flashy label, um, but it's still going to be around. Um, but it is kind of interesting how quickly that whole like, slogan got a black eye. It used to take longer for these things to cycle through and get a backlash, and now it happened pretty fast. So it's really funny. There's, um, I actually saw a chart this the other day that on earnings calls that all the big companies do quarterly, uh, mentions of ESG have just plummeted in the last two years. I mean, it used to be, you know, a lot of them that just <laughs> just dived and well, never heard of it, right? And you know, even Larry Fink at BlackRock says we don't use that term anymore. So there you go. Do we have any online questions? Oh, you got to look. Okay, because there's, you know, it's uh, Roger's father maybe watching. I don't know. You said hi, Dad. I right? hope so, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I always had mixed feelings Might be the about only that. one watching. <laughs> well, <coughs> I don't know. Um, the problem with it, I revisit these things is I, I get optimistic and then I get pessimistic again at the same time when I think about... Optimism the, makes you pessimistic. <laughs> okay, it could work that way, right? Yeah. By the way, my recollection of your department was not just the usual bureaucratic stuff, but I was actually sincerely impressed that it was not politicized. I mean, everyone there was mostly pretty left or far left, but they were serious about the issues, and it wasn't. And I, that was a good. That was a, to my mind, a sign of health. Yeah, yeah. we had a healthy, very healthy department. When you yeah. Uh, the listening asks two related questions. One is, what's the best way? To, the, to make inroads into the Biden administration, I think this is directed at you, Roger, but it, probably applicable to both, to make inroads into the Biden administration for applying the results of the latest studies on climate. Do you agree that it's likely that the old scenario implications will continue to be applied until after the presidential election to help the president mobilize his base? Yeah, boy, if I had, if I knew how to make inroads into the Biden administration, I'd probably have a different job than I have now. Um, I, I mean, I, this is the, the, the perennial problem of, of trying to get good policy analyses into political processes. Um, the Biden administration is, is very quickly painting itself into a corner on climate. Um, it, it has its social cost of carbon calculations. The EPA mm -hmm. regularly uses um, another methodology that depend upon um, this most extreme scenario, RCP 8.5. Um, the Biden administration's national climate assessment, which unfortunately is run out of the executive office of the president, um, has in its last two iterations, so going back 
Um, it was under Trump also. It identified this extreme scenario. This is the one that we're headed towards. And then this less extreme scenario, as the 4.5 scenario, this is policy success. Now, if you go to the Framework Convention on Climate Change and look at their annual report, you'll see that the real world trajectory is undershooting the success story. So let me repeat that. The real world, in terms of emissions, is undershooting the Biden administration's success story. Now, this creates a situation, how do you emerge from that? How do you come to the public and say, hey, you know that scenario we told you was success just, just two years ago? Oh, we're beating that now. We're, we're well ahead. That's a real hard message to get to put out because you look like uh, you're either being disingenuous or you didn't set the right target to begin with. So um, I do think, and, all right, the, and then the second part is that the emissions reductions, promises, commitments, targets of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, something like 50 to 52% by 2030 or 2035, um, the Biden administration is not going to hit those. Um, the Biden administration, based on its own Energy Information Administration, is uh, going to have an emissions reduction record of 0.7% reduction per year, when its target implies it's going to be 8 9% or more. Um, I wouldn't put that out before the election, but there's going to be um, some very dissatisfied, disgruntled people um, on the left <laughs> and the progressive side when they realize that th those aren't happening. So for me, I would go to the Biden administration and say, hey, your political fortunes going forward are going to be compromised by the fact that you painted yourself in the corner on climate. Maybe you should have some better policies um, rather than saying, hey, here's some better policies. You know, one of the yeah. ironies of the last few years is, I think this is still true, uh, that coal-fired power plant retirements happen faster under Trump than they have during Biden. Now, that's not the whole story. There's probably more parts to that. But... Here's the broader point, which one problem, especially in this issue, more so than many others, is the siloing of the way this modern government is, because it's so big. And uh, so I've long had the perception, both here and also with a lot of European governments, is that you'll have the people, in the, you know, the, the environmental advocates and people who've got various appointed jobs, and then you have the people in the finance ministries or in budget offices who actually know the score, <laughs> what it's going to cost and what it will actually do. Uh, and they often don't talk to each other. So, you know, if you go back to, just give one example, the, um, the Kyoto Protocol in the late 90s. Uh, and, you know, it was Larry Summers, as Treasury Secretary, who said this treaty is way too asymmetrical in its economic impact and telling the President Clinton privately, you really can't have this ratified. We can't really go with this. Thing. This thing's okay. Uh, now, fast forward to the Trump years. So Trump and his big tax bill, what was it, Regulation 45? I forget. There was this little feature that had a tax credit for lower carbon energy systems, and they, they, like $7 a ton was the tax advantage of it. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. That means the Trump administration just put a price on carbon. I wonder if the Trump administration knows that's happening. <laughs> right? So the point is, is that there's somewhat more continuity between, you might say, the people you never hear about, people at the Energy Information Administration, people in the e some of the people in the EPA, and then the people driving policy for you know, the, a mix of reasons, many of them political in the White Houses and all the rest of that. That's an ongoing problem with both parties. Uh, and you know, I don't know if we'll ever make much progress on all that, but that's the background dynamic is uh, the, the different the actual practical real world differences between the two parties are, are not as wide as you would think from reading the newspapers. Yeah, let me way. just respond to one thing Steve sure. said. Um, presidents, sitting presidents don't close coal-fired power plants. Right. Um, yeah. And if you want to know why coal-fired power plants are closing you know, this decade and the previous decade, you have to go back to the 1970s to, to, you know, to Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, to policies put in place then mm. that laid the foundation for the technological innovations that would be the fracking revolution. Right. And I mean, this is why smart energy policy is important because the decisions we put in place today are going to be powering the United States and the world in 2050. Um, and it's not, oh, we're going to pass a law today, and then tomorrow we'll see these changes. I see we're getting the, 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 the hook is coming out. So Yeah, well, that, I think we've exhausted everybody. I think we much, have, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've gone all day, but that would be, that would be bad. Yeah, I gotta so, go and you've got to go again tonight. Gotta tonight. So, yeah. yeah, do all come so. back tonight for uh, the more detailed part yeah. of it. That'll be fun. I'll be here. Good. So. All right. Well, well thank thanks, everybody. Much. Thank you, Roger. That's great. Yeah.